is the entire sentencing hearing of Eric Holder. I had some delays in acquiring the footage because not every single time it's the same network or the same pool that's shooting the footage. Because the courts are trying to alleviate the number of camera people that can come into a courtroom, they assign it to one person and then that person, that network, is responsibility is to give that to the rest of the media that's present. When I reached out to Fox 11 News, because this was the only time they shot video in this entire case was during the sentencing. On all the other days where they shot footage, it was other networks, and I had no problem with those networks and getting the footage immediately and quickly. Fox 11 News even tried to deny me the footage for whatever reason. Um, it's you know I had to get on the phone and waste extra time, but I finally got it. I got it all together, and here it is. Uh, the entire the entire let, let me just give you a brief rundown of what this what this video includes. It's going to start off with two victim impact statements, one by Najee Ali. Najee Ali has been in the community doing activist work for like 30 years strong. I've known bro probably most of those years. I want to say I've known bro, I've known bro since I was a youngster. So uh, I grew up watching this dude do his thing, and um, then I be- got an opportunity to know him. And you know, I've been I've been acquaintances with Najee Ali for I don't know how long, uh, two decades strong. And he gave a very powerful impact statement in the beginning, and then that's followed by an impact statement by Herman Cowboy Douglas. After the impact statements, um, they go into the mitigation. Uh, Aaron Jansen, defense attorney Aaron Jansen, goes into the mitigation, and the mitigation includes a letter from Eric Holder Sr., the father of Eric Holder, which was written on August 29th, 2022. And then it's gonna go into testimony from a psychiatrist Dr. Carol Lieberman, but then there's an objection and uh, I'll let you watch what happens there. And then that's going to be followed up by defense attorney Jansen reading a social history of Eric Holder. So you're going to get pretty much his whole life story in a social history presented by defense attorney Jansen. And then after that, the prosecution is going to speak. John McKinney is going to explain how many years he should get Eric Holder and why he should get those years. And then that's going to be followed up by the sentencing by judge H clay Jack. And here it goes. Impact statements. Yes. Your Honor. There are two individuals here today who would like to address the court with regard to the impact of Mr. Askadon's uh, loss on both the community and on them personally, starting with Mr. Najee Ali. Please, sir. Honorable uh, Judge Jackie, my name is Najee Ali. Uh, for the record, N A J E E. Last name is A L I. As a member of the Crenshaw community for over 30 years and a stakeholder, uh, someone who knew Nipsey Hussle, I'm here to say that his murder has had a devastating and tremendous impact still to this day on our community. Not only was Nipsey a Grammy Award winning hip hop artist, he was much more than that. He was a philanthropist, an entrepreneur, business person, mentor, role model. He was a hero to many young people in the Crenshaw area, but also throughout the nation. When he was murdered, his death struck a chord with many. Uh, so with that, Your Honor, uh, I would respectfully ask that 
Eric Holder be sentenced to the maximum sentence possible, especially due to the fact that he has never apologized, never shown any remorse for what he did. So I believe that he deserves the maximum sentence possible. And in my closing, you know, many young people are monitoring and watching this, and they're depending on you to be their voice uh, for justice. And I want to thank uh, D.A. McKinney for bringing Mr. Holder to justice and serving the people of California uh, and our community uh, with pride and dignity in doing your job. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. Next, Your Honor, uh, is Mr. Herman Douglas. Mr. Douglas? Uh, Herman Douglas, H-E-R-M-A-N-Douglas, I worked for Nipsey Nipsey, my friend. He was like a son. He was like a dad. Hey, when I was in court listening to this, I thought I heard it wrong. But apparently, Cowboy did say it. Nipsey was like a son, and he was like a dad. I don't think I've ever heard anybody say that about one person. But I just thought that was that was an interesting statement. Let's continue. Our community right now, we lost everything. Everything we worked for, one person took that person to our community. Thousands of jobs we don't have no more. Homies don't have nothing to do. They backslide. They robbing people now. We had stuff to do. Now they don't have nothing to do. All our stores are closed down. All the, we were relying on jobs. The whole community relied on them and the team that we had down there. Now the team is not down there. Nip is not down there. The whole community is affected. All of our stores are closed. We have nowhere to go. We can't go to Ross to get no food. The only thing that we have is that shopping center. That shopping center is closed down now. Tourists are coming by there, can't even take pictures no more. Everything we built got tore down. One man's mistake, one man's action messed up a whole community. Our whole community is suffering to this day. These kids don't have nowhere to go. They have nothing to do, they have nothing to look up to no more. And, and the world still wants to know why. That we want to know why would somebody do that to a person that was leading the whole community, why? We want to know why. That's all we want to know is why. We will possess a person to take a person out of our community that was so powerful. So many people depended on that person. Nobody depended on this other person. Everybody depended on this one person in our community. Let me stop right there real quick because I think we know why it happened. I think we know why Eric Holder did what he did. He obviously did what he did as a result of that four minute conversation that he had with Nipsey. He left that conversation feeling a different kind of way than he did when he started that conversation. Cowboy was present for that conversation. Rimpaw was present for that conversation. So was another individual present for most of that conversation. Bernina Nicholson was present for about a minute or two minutes of that conversation. So whatever was said in that conversation and no one has that conversation verbatim, that's why, that's why Eric Holder decided to do what he did. Let's continue. And they want mercy from this guy. Where was the mercy when he was kicking Nipsey on the ground? Where was that mercy at? Where was that mercy at? You want some mercy? You want somebody to show you some love? You ain't even looked at nobody. You ain't even look at the jury and show no respect, no no remorse. Sir. To say, sir. my bad, I messed up. You know, sir. I okay. got you. I'm trying to do it the right way. Thank you, know, you, sir. All right. But there's been no remorse from the individual that's on trial. Okay. So I'm asking you, Judge, it really, you know, the time, I don't care what you get this guy. It, it ain't about the time. I need to know why. I wish I could get that. You know, his fate is sealed. He took a man's life. His life is getting taken. Simple as that. You know, it goes against the body. So his life has been forfeited. So he has to deal with God. You know, uh, like I said, I just would, would like to know why. Why would you take such a person out of our community like that? So, Judge, I know you're going to do the right thing. Thank you. All right, let's 
proceed with sentencing. We have a round for judgment. Um, Your Honor, we'd like to. I'm, I'm going to give you that opportunity. Yes. Uh, is there any legal cause why judgment should not now be pronounced? Yes, Your Honor. We would like to present the court with mitigation. All right. Proceed. This is a, a letter from Eric Holder Sr. to this court, and I'd like to read it and make it part of the record. Very well. My name is Eric Holder Sr., the father of Eric Holder Jr. I first want to express my sincerest and deepest apologies to Mr. Kerry Latham, Sherman Villanueva, and the family of Hermias Askadon for the fatal action taken by my son, Eric Jr. I know there are not enough words for apologies that will fill the void, the loss, the pain, the deep sorrow, and the family, the family of Hermias Askadam is experiencing. You cannot imagine the agony, the grief, the utter disbelief and devastation I feel knowing my son, Eric Jr., took another person's life. I question myself every day, asking if I, as a father, did everything possible to help Eric Jr. stabilize his mental health condition. At no time since Eric Jr.'s diagnosis was there ever an indication that he was violent. I witnessed Eric Jr. on several occasions have conversations when no one was present. But none of those conversations, but those conversations did not result in anything violent in nature for many years. At the age of nine years old, in agreement with Eric Jr.'s mother, it was decided that Eric Jr. would primarily reside in my care. I knew as a father, especially an African-American father, I had to wrap myself around Eric Jr. because of struggles and biases faced in the African-American community. It was an adjustment, but a phenomenal experience raising my son, Eric Jr., as a single father. We bonded and I was proud of the man he was becoming. As a teenager, I started heading down a scary and dangerous direction, despite the efforts from my mother who raised five children as a single mother. I knew I had to change my life, so I enlisted in the military, proudly served three years in the U.S. Army. The time I spent in the Army gave me direction and purpose, and I knew I wanted to spend my life helping others in my community, and my community. I'm, not, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not this, this letter has now gone off in the direction of Mr. Eric Holder Sr. speaking about his own life. <coughs> it doesn't address any mitigation purpose uh, at this point. It, it does in the remaining paragraph. Go, go to that portion, please. Yes, Sean. Um, I quickly applied to become a children's social worker for Los Angeles Department County County Department of Children and Family Services and later was promoted to supervising children's social worker, which is the position I currently hold. I tried to instill the same calling in my son, Eric Jr. I've been helping children and families for the past 26 years. This position, coupled with my education, has allotted me the ability to recognize signs of distress and mental health issues. <coughs> So as Eric Jr. grew closer to 19 years old, I started noticing some small but significant behavioral changes. At the age of 19, Eric Jr. had his first mental health episode and was diagnosed with auditory schizophrenia. As you can imagine, this diagnosis literally brought me to my knees. Eric Jr. was released from the hospital in a catatonic state. I immediately had, a, had to become educated on how to support a now young man with very challenging mental health condition. This education process showed me that to stabilize Eric Jr.'s mental health, I had to become extremely involved because I was fighting his auditory hallucinations. Eric Jr. was taking his prescribed medication for several months. However, Eric Jr. was still having auditory hallucinations. I would take Eric Jr. to his therapist once a month 
and his therapist could not understand why Eric Jr. was still having auditory hallucinations. This went on for months, and the therapist would continue to increase his medication, but to no avail. It progressed to the point that the therapist could no longer increase the dosage because Eric Jr. was on the highest dosage <coughs> allowed. As a last resort, Eric Jr. agreed to transcranial magnetic stimulation therapy. Judge, you know, this is not mitigation. Well, I think it deals with the, the type of uh, therapy he had, so overall. As a last re resort, Eric Jr. agreed to transcranial magnetic stimulation therapy, electric shock therapy. Eric Jr. took the chance that knowing that he would lose his short-term memory, <coughs> However, Eric Jr. was willing to try anything to stop having auditory hallucinations. But even with the aggressive treatment, Eric Jr. continued to have auditory hallucinations. Shortly after receiving this transcranial magnetic stimulation therapy, Eric Jr.'s mother passed away. Eric Jr. was devastated and had a difficult time managing his grief. As a result, I urged Eric Jr. <coughs> He did not talk about what he was feeling. My belief is that Eric Jr. was not capable of articulating his feelings due to his grief and progressing mental condition. On several occasions, I witnessed Eric disassociate after succumbing to auditory hallucinations. Eric Jr. would never tell me what the auditory hallucinations were telling or asking him to do. However, as his parent, I knew the hallucinations were either asking or telling him to do something he did not want to do, as he would have a repugnant <laughs> expression and would shake his head, no. As a father, not having the power to help Eric Jr. overcome or heal from something that was constantly tormenting him, tore me up inside, and it still does to this day. I know my son Eric would have never committed such a heinous crime if he did not have auditory schizophrenia. Knowing and understanding the less than optimal outcomes for African American <coughs> inmates, especially those with mental health component, I respectfully, I am respectfully pleading with this court to remand my son Eric Jr. forthwith to a locked mental health facility where his mental health could be properly treated. With deepest sympathy, Eric Holder Sr. I'd like to talk about Mr. Holder's background and his social history um, in the hope that it will convince this court to exercise its discretion um, as part of mitigation. Um, he's 29 years old at the time this happened, and he had really no criminal history other than he had a possession of a firearm that was illegal, he was on probation for that. And um, his probation was terminated. His family history of mental health. Eric, his older sister and his maternal un uncle remember his mother spending extended time in bed. Eric recalls that she alternated between episodes of high energy when she was extremely productive and busy and episodes of low energy when she couldn't get herself out of bed for days at a time. They all agree that she was able to secure work only sporadically and the family relied largely on the mother's modest salary. His mother, who supported the family as a medical assistant, also had anger issues. She scapegoated Eric in particular verbally and physically abusing him with a belt, cords, anything within reach, and calling him names um, even when he was a baby. Eric's paternal grandmother and uncle report that his mother was slow and that Eric exhibited symptoms of cognitive deficiencies at a young age. <clears throat> Mr. Eric Jr.'s early mental history includes even as a small child, he struggled to sit still and concentrate at school. He was sent to mandatory counseling, 
sessions each morning from third grade to the seventh grade. He appreciated the extra help and that talking to an understanding adult helped calm him. In middle school, he was sent to both counseling and referred to a mental health summer camp in middle school. He didn't attend because the family was resistant and suspicious of mental health treatment. Mr. Eric Jr. suffered through food insecurity. Six years before Eric's birth, his mother gave birth to a daughter whose father was incarcerated. Because his mother worked infrequently, she and the children relied on free lunch program <coughs> and government assistance to survive. They sometimes ran out of food and went hungry. Meanwhile, Eric's mother gave birth to two additional children whose fathers were not involved in the family's life or survival. Eric's mother struggled. She found only intermittent, intermediate work even as her brood grew. Mr. Eric Jr. suffered from a lack of me proper medical care. He got medical attention only at school and saw a dentist only when his cavities were so bad that he complained about intense pain. Once he had to have a tooth pulled because it had corroded beyond the point of repair and the wound became so infected that he had to miss days of school. Lack of household hygiene. The family struggled to keep their various apartments clean. They used laundry mats when they could but Eric had to make do with dirty clothes when they couldn't. His father bought him new clothes, but his siblings resented this and took their jealousy out on him. Eric Holder Jr. suffered from an unstable home life. Eric's parents never lived together and ended their relationship when he was about two years old. He lived in a series of locations in Compton, South LA and Long Beach apartments with his grandmother, mother, sister, uncle, older sister, and younger brother until the third grade. Their basic utilities were turned off routinely due to lack of payment. When Eric was nine, his mother met a new partner, a man with a steady job. She sent Eric to live with his father while she, her children, and new baby moved into a modest house in North Long Beach. Eric was despondent. His mother had been his entire world, the one person he turned to for connection, affection, and <clears throat> approval. He did not understand his, his banishment, nor her abandonment. Eric Sr. lived with his wife and her son, who was a year older than Eric. Eric did not feel welcome. The two boys competed for affection, and it created conflict between them. <coughs> Eric Sr. divorced his wife after she hit Eric Jr. Eric and his father moved into the infamous Crenshaw District, where street gangs were entrenched and notorious. Eric Sr. was chronically distracted by his demanding work for the Department of Children and Family Services and an intense exercise regimen. Eric Jr. was all but living on his own. His father would only sleep at their apartment, while Eric Jr. was left to shop, cook, <clears throat> protect, and transport himself. Eric had few limits or rules, and by the time he was 12, he had no clear curfew. While walking to and from school, Eric was targeted by neighborhood bullies. When older gang members stepped in to protect him, he felt safe and valued and less alone. His father ignored the trouble Eric Jr. was getting into, as well as the extensive collection of tattoos that he began accumulating. While Eric Jr. had relied heavily on his mother for emotional support, his interaction with her was extremely limited after he moved to in with his father. He didn't have a cell phone, a landline, nor access to transportation. He felt abandoned and despondent. His mother and her three younger children moved with her new husband to a safer, quieter area north, in North Long Beach. Eric felt jealous that, he got, that they got to live with her in relative stability while he was alone in Los Angeles. <clears throat> Eric Jr. suffered violence. 
in his life. By the time he was three, Eric was allowed to walk to the store without adult supervision, even though the area was dangerous. His mother taught him to defend himself with his fists in case anything happened outside or in school. He also knew to run home and stay low if he heard gunshots, to find a bathtub to hide from bullets, never to stand by a window, especially if it was backlit. He often heard gunshots and other indicia of gang warfare, both at school and at home. He was disciplined with belts and other objects and verbally abused with words that would make him cry. His father beat him like a man to toughen him up. He also witnessed his mother being beaten up at the hands of various boyfriends. <clears throat> this was particularly difficult for him because he felt responsible for her protection, but he was no match for angry, grown men. His education, um, he went to Wenshaw High School, but after several months he was transferred to City of Angels independent homeschool because his father believed that traditional school wasn't a good fit for him. He matriculated to community college but was frustrated by the rigorous academic demands and dropped out. Eric Jr.'s work history included working in restaurants during and after high school. Eric trained at Santa Monica Pacific Park Harbor Grill. He worked at Panera Bread in Santa Monica, as well as Dog House and Kingfish in Long Beach. After he was diagnosed with schizophrenic disorder, he was awarded SSI disability. His relationship history. When Eric was about 17, he began a relationship with a woman, and after a year and a half, she became pregnant. <coughs> They didn't tell Eric's family because he was afraid that his father would kick him out of the apartment where they lived with him. Their daughter was born in September 2008. Eric was a terrific father, attending to his daughter, taking her to doctor's appointments, supporting and fussing over her. Even as his relationship with his mother became strained by his mental health deterioration, he maintained close relationship with his daughter. He tried to reunite with the mother several times including relocating, to an, relocating out of state to be with them. He currently speaks with her as often as he can, given the seriousness of his present situation. His daughter loves and misses him very much, and his mother is committed to supporting and preserving the father-daughter relationship. The death of his mother. Eric's mother suddenly died a few years before the shooting. I'm sorry, a few months before the shooting. She had been hospitalized with different conditions, including <coughs> heart failure, prediabetes, and kidney failure, but she downplayed their seriousness. Her youngest daughter found her dead in her bed. Eric had been in daily contact with her, calling when his hallucinations tormented him, but he hadn't known she was ill. At her funeral, Eric told his older sister that he was totally alone and that their mother had been the only person who loved him. Mental health deterioration. As a teen, Eric was repeatedly jumped and beaten by his peers. At 13, he was forced to fight five older boys for a crazy minute. He survived but sustained head trauma, bloody nose and mouth, <clears throat> and he sought no medical attention. Tragically, when his daughter was small, Eric suffered two violent car accidents with significant head trauma. In about 2010, he was broadsided by a turning car, turning left on King Boulevard. He was taken to Harbor UCLA and for three, for three days. He had to have his ear sutured and ocular surgery. In 2016, he was jumped, attacked, and sustained a fractured jaw. When he was about 20, he was driving in the rain and his brakes failed, and he plowed headfirst into a brick wall. His head broke the windshield, and he was rendered unconscious. His car was totaled. When he came to, he saw someone walking and asked to use the phone to call him at one. He walked to Sentinella Hospital. 
After the second accident, he developed acute psychosis, and his medical and psychiatric doctors failed to understand or successfully treat it. He de developed severe paranoia and auditory hallucinations. He began laughing and talking to imagined people. He believed that TV personalities were communicating with him through the television itself. About eight months after the second accident, his father called the police and had a welfare and institution code 5150 hold placed on him because he was hallucinating. He was arrested and sent to West LA, then transferred to a facility in Long Beach for at least two weeks. He was committed to inpatient psychiatric services another three times in Long Beach for about a month, in Las Vegas in 2016 for four days, and in San Pedro for two weeks. He has sought outpatient treatment as well in South Central Los Angeles and Watts every weekend for three months, as well as in downtown LA three days a week for two weeks. He began a terrible descent into mental illness that despite his determination and hard work, had not relented. He has a psychiatrist and psychologist at Kaiser Hospital who have attempted to treat his acute disorders of hearing voices, depression, hallucinations, and paranoia with medications and psychiatric interventions. When none of these worked, he was referred to and endured six sessions of electroconvulsive therapy. After years of torment and struggle, including losing his girlfriend and daughter, being repeatedly kicked out of his father's home, and qualifying for disability insurance, Eric agreed to the six sessions of electric shock therapy. He hoped that the radical, last-ditch intervention would silence the voices that dominated for waking hours and stopped him from resting. He hoped it would stop the crippling paranoia that convinced him that he was being hunted and targeted. Despite reinsurances that he would be cured, Eric emerged from electric shock therapy further impaired. Moreover, he lost much of his memory and ability to take care of himself independently. The treatment rendered him non-functional. He was catatonic after each session, unable to attend to even his most basic needs. He hired a young woman off the streets to ensure that he would eat, bathe, sleep, and engage in other activities. But the voices returned. His terrors continued. She left because of his extreme paranoia and active hallucinations. He invited his maternal uncle, who was struggling to find shelter, to stay with him. Despite Eric's generosity, his uncle found staying with him to be impossible. Eric was too paranoid to give him a key, and the rhythm of his days was erratic. He would pace the apartment, smoke compulsively, and stay up all night. He laughed and spoke to himself constantly. He barricaded himself in the apartment to protect himself from imagined enemies. Three weeks before the alleged incident, sorry, three weeks before the shooting, Eric threw a weight through a window because the voices told him to. He was terrified that he would be murdered. He knew that he needed help and tried to get admitted to a hospital, but no but had no one to call or take him in. Your Honor, at this time I'd like the court to hear from um, Dr. Carol Lieberman. Um, she has evaluated Mr. Holder Jr. and she can expand more on his mental health condition. She's also reviewed his mental health records. She has a, a statement to read to the court.
morning, Your Honor. I stand before you today as the forensic psychiatrist and expert witness who was originally appointed by Judge Teresa Sullivan on April 11, 2019, to evaluate Mr. Eric Ronald Holder, Jr. I have been working as a forensic psychiatrist and expert witness for over 20 years. For over 20 years. escort him in waist chains, 
and ankle chains. And for the first part of this proceeding, he would be brought to court in that manner. Even if it was just a five minute hearing to pick a new court date. Even when he was back in the holding cell in the courtroom, he still would have waist chains and ankle chains, making it diff difficult or impossible to even use the restroom facilities while waiting for his case to be called. <coughs> Once he gets to state prison, he's a target. There's a green light on him from all the gangs, all the people that love Nipsey Hussle. And so his life in prison is going to be hell for as long as it lasts. Mark as Defense Exhibit D. These are photographs of the psychotropic medications that were found in Eric Holder Jr.'s apartment when the police executed a search warrant. Should be Defense Exhibit D. E. E. Mark. F is a uh, faded out version of the same shelf with the medications. Defense G is a close up of more bottles of psychotropic medication, olazapine, which is generic for psychotropic, psychotropic medication used to treat schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. This is all the medication that he was taking, supposed to be taking, on a daily basis. Defense Exhibit F, as in Frank, is another photograph of Mr. Holder Jr.'s medication on the dresser that the police found at his apartment when they searched him. Defense Exhibit G is the Telecare Mental Health Facility in <coughs> Bellflower, where Mr. Holder Jr. surrendered himself after two days. Two days after the shooting, he showed up to Telecare Mental Health Clinic and uh, was arrested without <coughs> in, arrested without incident. And we know that that police jargon means that he gave up without a struggle when the police came to arrest him in the parking lot. Your Honor, defense is asking the court to exercise its discretion to not impose the 25 to year, 25 year to life firearm enhancement. We're asking for 25 to life, which is the mandatory minimum on the count one, the first degree murder. We're asking the court to stay the 25 to life sentencing enhancement for use of the firearm. We're also asking the court to run the other counts to be concurrent, meaning the charge against Herman Douglas and the charge against I'm sorry, the charge against uh, Sherman V. Lindueva and the charge against Kerry Lake to run concurrent and to not to impose the firearm enhancements on those. Uh, if the court is so inclined to sentence on the uh, assault with a firearm as to Mr. Lake, then we would ask that the midterm be imposed on that count for three years. <clears throat> making it the sentence 28 years to life. Now, 28 years to life is a long, long sentence. He would not even be eligible for parole until um, 
25 years. And there's no good time, work time on that, as the court is aware. That's 25 actual years in prison before he's even eligible for parole. And what, what that means is that he's eligible to be considered for parole. Does it mean that he would be paroled after doing 25 actual years? But it means that he would come before the parole board and he would have an eligibility hearing after 25 years. They may deny it. The governor may deny it. And he may never get paroled. That's where the life comes in. So we're asking the court to impose the sentence of 25 to life um, based on the mental health history, based on the social history of Mr. Eric Holder Jr. Um, and the 25 to year life sentence leaves open the possibility, just the possibility for rehabilitation. Leaves open the possibility for advancements in mental health treatment so that maybe by then, science will improve and he can receive effective treatment for which he's so desperately sought help for. And um, basically, the medical community failed to address the psychiatric issues that he had that took over, tormented him, and ruined his life. Your Honor, we would ask that the court exercise its discretion in this manner and to show mercy on Mr. Eric Holder Jr. and impose the lengthy sentence of 25 to life. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, briefly. <coughs> I don't normally make comments at a sentencing. I normally submit on the people's sentencing memorandum. Today I'll make an exception and I'll keep it brief. First of all, I want to thank Mr. Naji Ali and Herman Douglas for coming here today and opening up to the court about the impact of Nixie Hustle's loss on their lives and on the community uh, that he served. I was particularly struck by Mr. Douglas's statement that Nipsey, for him, was like a son and like a dad. We don't ordinarily hear a comment like that, that somebody who starts off in life as a student goes on to become the master, so to speak. He talked about Nipsey Incorporated, that Nipsey Hustle was more than just an artist, that he was himself an industry that provided jobs to a lot of people in the community, a lot of people who were living in the shadows of our, our, of our society, that he motivated them, inspired them, and gave them something to do with their time, something positive. And we know that if you were close to Nipsey Hussle, you probably had a business of some sort. Because in addition to being an artist, he was an entrepreneur. And I thought Mr. Douglas, Mr. Douglas's comments were particularly poignant in pointing out the fact that this killing didn't just delete one human being from our community. It had an impact that was like a tsunami in South LA where Nipsey Hussle lived. It in fact impacted people not just around the country but all over the world. He said the homies had nothing to do now. They're, they're, they're going backwards, they're backsliding, they're resorting to committing robberies, things that they weren't doing before when Nipsey Hussle was alive. And there has been no one to step up and fill that void. And that's sad. That's sad for all of us. And that really drives home the impact of this particular killing in this community. Eric Holder exhibited a high degree of cruelty, viciousness, and callousness in the way that he killed Nipsey Hussle. He fired at least 10 separate shots Nipsey Hussle suffered 11 gunshot wounds. At the end of that shooting, 
we all saw in the video that he walked over and kicked him in the head before running off. Now, I've heard a lot from Mr. Jansen this morning about Mr. Holder's social history and some of the struggles he had in life. None of that comes close to justifying what his client did to a defenseless Hermes Askadam on that Sunday afternoon. Doesn't even come close to explaining why it happened. Mr. Douglas said, I don't care about the time. I just want to know why. So many people want to know why. Nothing presented by the defense today addressed that question of why. And the reason for that is there is no explanation for why. There is no explanation for why somebody would do that to another human being. And so that's why we have a penal code. That's why we build these courtrooms. And that's why we have prisons. For place, there's a place for people like Mr. Holder who need to be sequestered from society for a very, very long time. So as a representative of the people, I stand before you today to ask that you sentence him to 60 years to life, 25 years to life for the murder of Ermias Askadam, 25 years to life consecutive to that for the use of a firearm causing death, and an additional 10 years for the assault on Kerry Layton, which caused great bodily injury and changed his life forever. The remaining counts we ask that the court run <coughs> to the 60 years to life submitted. This court is ever mindful its uh, responsibility to not only listen to and evaluate uh, the mitigation presented uh, by the uh, defense, including the um, letter from Dr. Lieberman, uh, which the court has considered. The court has also considered the position of the people. Uh, to the extent, the defense didn't say exactly didn't say it explicitly, but to the extent uh, the defense was asking this court to dismiss any enhancements, uh, the court finds by clear and convincing evidence that to do so would endanger public safety. Principally, the court looked at not only the one, but the two guns that uh, Mr. Holder used in the uh, killing of uh, Mr. Askinon, as well as the shooting of Mr. Lathan and Mr. Van uh, However, the sentence that uh, the court is about to pronounce, uh, I am very mindful of um, what was presented as to Mr. Holder's uh, mental health history. I'm also mindful of the devastation caused to the victims and their families. So I think uh, this sentence balances both. Uh, the principal term in this sentence will be count three, the 245A2 on Mr. Latham. The court selects the midterm of three years in state prison. For the gun, there will be an additional four years in state prison consecutive. And then for the rape bodily injury allegation that was found true, it will be uh, three years consecutive to that. So for count three, it will be a total of 10 years in state prison. As to count two, which was the attempted voluntary manslaughter, Mr. Lathan being the victim, uh, the court has doubts as to the viability of that count because there was no provocation uh, by Mr. Lathan. Same holds true for Mr. Being away. Uh, the court believes that uh, it is 654, uh, so that the court would impose the midterm of three years plus the four years and the three years, but stay uh, those sentences. If the court is incorrect about uh, uh, the 654 application, I would impose the same terms and run them concurrent. 
As to count five, uh, the 245A2 as to Mr. Uh, being away, uh, the court uh, selects the midterm of three years plus the four years for the, that's the midterm for the use of the gun. Uh, it's a total of seven years, but run that concurrent. As to uh, count four, the attempted uh, voluntary manslaughter. Again, this court feels that uh, 654 is applicable so that uh, it would impose the three years, uh, the midterm, plus four years for the gun, but stay it. Once again, if the court is incorrect about that application, it would be the midterm of three years plus four years for the gun, and that would run concurrent. As to count six, Penal Code Section 2980081, possession of a firearm by a felon. <coughs> As this was the uh, gun used, or one of the guns used uh, uh, by the defendant, uh, court feels this is 654 and would select the uh, midterm of two years and stay that. Uh, otherwise, it would be two years concurrent. As to count one, the murder in the first degree of Mr. Askadon, the sentence will be the term prescribed by law, which is 25 years to life. In addition, there will be the 12022.53B allegation, uh, which is consecutive. That will be an additional 25 years to life. So for count one alone, it would be 50 years to life. Uh, the total sentence would be 60, 60 years to life in prison. The court should note that the other enhancements found true as to count one by the jury, the 12022.53b and the 12022.53c, uh, those would not be imposed because of 12022.53 sub f. The court would uh, also recommend uh, to the Department of Corrections that the defendant be housed in a facility uh, that would address uh, his mental health needs. Uh, what are uh, his actual credits, please? 1,423. So Judge Jack sentenced Eric Holder to a total of 60 years, but when you do the math on all the counts, on all the years that the judge gave him for each count, that comes out to 83 years. So that's what the judge meant by trying to find a balance between understanding the mental health issues, but also imposing a sentence that's serious enough so that the, all the victim's family could, would be satisfied. And that's when they that's where they came up with the 60 years. So he got 25 years for killing Nipsey Hussle plus 25 years for using the gun. That's 50 years with the gun enhancement. And then he got 10 years on count three, 10 years on count three for shooting Carrie Latham in the back. So he got three years plus four years for the gun. And then he got three years for the great bodily injury enhancement. So that's 10 years. And then all the other counts, count two, count four, five, and six, ran concurrent to, to the full sentence. So, for example, on count two, he could have received an additional seven years for the attempted voluntary manslaughter. That was three years plus four years for the gun. But count two runs concurrent. Count four, he received uh, three years for the attempted voluntary manslaughter plus four years for the gun. Another seven years that ran concurrent to the total sentence of 60. Then he could have received on count five, which was um, the attempted, no, count, count five, count five was actually the assault on Villanueva, 
uh, he, he received three years plus four years for the gun. That's another seven years that runs concurrent. And then on the last count, count six, possession of a firearm, he received two years, which runs concurrent with the rest of the sentence. So a total of 21, 22, 20, 23 years, a total of 23 years runs concurrent with the rest of the sentence. So instead of receiving the 83 to life, he received the 60. And of course, the defense, uh, Aaron Jansen, was asking for 25 years. And I did the math on here. Uh, the balance between the, the mid the midterm between 25 years, which is what the defense was asking for and the 83 years total, which he could have got is would have been 54 years, 54 years. So that would have been a little less than the 60 years that he received. But also let's do a little bit of math on how much time will Eric Holder really spend in prison if he's, you know, lives long enough because in the state of California, you do 85% of your time. So right off the bat, he's looking at 51 years before he's eligible for parole that he's got to do 51 years. Remember, he's got a life sentence on this so he can get denied um, on his on his first eligibility for parole. But let's just assume that he's going to be released as soon as he's eligible for parole. That would mean he has to do 85 percent, 51 years. And as you heard, he's got credit for. Four to over 1,400 days. Let's just round that off to four years. That means he's got to do 47 years in prison before he can even be released. And that means that he won't be eligible for parole until the year 2070. All right, let's get back to the last part of the video. As to uh, restitution, I believe there's a request uh, that we continue uh, the matter for restitution hearing setting, is that correct? Yes, sir. One month, please. All right. A date, please. Any date, uh, that's the end of the council. Going about a month now, more or less. Mr. Jansen? About March 21st. All right, it'll be 321 for that. Now, uh, Mr. Holder, you have a uh, right to be present during that hearing. You also uh, can waive uh, your appearance, and uh, Mr. Jansen will represent you at that hearing and uh, notify you of any results uh, from that uh, restitution hearing. Uh, what is your decision, sir? Do you want to be present, or do you wish to waive your appearance? Let me talk to my police, Your Honor. Section 296 and 296.1. 